In 2002, GTA Vice City released a year after GTA 3, a game which laid the foundations for open worlds as we know them today. Vice City began as DLC for GTA 3, as an opportunity to add in features that didn't make it into the original game. But over time, the scope of the project grew large enough to be a standalone title, and so the next instalment in the Grand Theft Auto franchise was born. In many ways, Vice City is a bigger and better game. Its sandbox has been expanded to include more melee and range weapons, we have more vehicles, including motorbikes and helicopters, and we have outfits, interior locations, more side content, and brand new mechanics in the form of property management. But Vice City wasn't made in three years like GTA 3 or GTA 5, or even eight years like Red Dead Redemption 2. It was made in one. This tight development window means some parts of the game haven't received the attention they should, and there are technical issues depending on the version you play. Which brings us to two questions I'll answer throughout this review. Is a year long enough to develop a game? And more importantly, is GTA Vice City still great today? To answer these questions, I'll be comparing Vice City to old and new games, and reviewing it by the standards of 2021. Oh, and spoilers by the way, I'll be spoiling everything in Vice City, from story to missions to mechanics. So with that out of the way, let's begin. In GTA Vice City, we play as Tommy Vicetti. Tommy is a member of the Mafia who's recently been released from prison after a 15-year sentence. We see Sonny, the head of the Mafia, describing the plan for Tommy, now he's back. Sonny sends us to Vice City to build up a drug empire in this fictional version of 80s Miami. So we land at Escobar Airport, meet up with Sonny's lawyer Ken Rosenberg and head to a drug deal with a suitcase full of money. And yep, of course, things go wrong. It's quite similar to the start of GTA 3, where we're running a job and get double-crossed, but rather than being crossed by our girlfriend Catalina, we have no idea who attacked us. For the rest of the game, we work with key members of the city to find out who ambushed us and to take back the money they stole. You can see that Vice City wears its inspirations on its sleeve. Its setting is heavily influenced by the neon tinge of Miami Vice, and the story is essentially the story from Scarface, where our main protagonist enters Miami and rises to the top of a criminal empire. Later on, we even get a property which is decorated like Tony Montana's estate, which was a nice nod to the source material. Overall, the story is more cohesive than GTA 3, as we're always working towards that goal of finding the people who double-crossed us. Early on we work with Ken and meet the main players in Vice City, who can all help us in different ways. Juan Cortez, a colonel from Central America, Avery Carrington, one of the biggest property developers in Vice City, and Ricardo Diaz, a kingpin with a cocaine problem and a bad temper. Bro, you! It is my favorite El Burro movie, it's die. What else can I do? It's probably not plugged in. What? Although it is pretty video gamey, as each person says they'll only help us if we help them in return. These moments are engaging as we always have the end goal in sight. This is a significant step up compared to GTA 3, where only a handful of missions add to the overall plot. Occasionally, we do take offshoots from the main story when we work with other eccentric citizens of Vice City, like Phil Cassidy, an ex-army man who's obsessed with moonshine and explosions or the band's love fist as we score them drugs and deal with an obsessive fan. But even though we're diverting away from the main story, these moments are all incredible. The characters are creative, wacky and endearing to the point where we never feel shortchanged. In fact, one of the best characters in Vice City is Lance Vance. We meet Lance early on and he quickly tells us that he and Tommy want the same thing. Lance's brother was murdered by the same people who ambushed us, which means both of our paths have crossed at the perfect time. After this point, we spend a lot of time with Lance, who is an extremely likeable character. Good shooting, my friend! You're a real, proper, grade-A lunatic! Well, thank you. The relationship between Lance and Tommy is one of the highlights of the game, where they felt like a buddy cop duo, working together and having each other's back. And again, you can see the influence for these characters from Crockett and Tubbs, the undercover cop duo in Miami Vice. 
It helps that the characters are more like real people, and less like the stereotypes we saw in GTA 3. There's good banter between Lance and Tommy, but we also have characters acting in realistic ways. For example, characters will call us in-game on our massive mobile phone. They'll comment on something we've done, like buying a business, or simply call for a chat. What I really like here is that we can choose to accept or ignore the call. This sounds like a small detail, but not only is it realistic, it means if we're busy, we can take the call later. And I'm bringing this up because Cyberpunk also tried to use this technique, but CD Projekt Red completely balls it up. Basically, there was no option to reject a call, so characters would constantly pop up on screen and talk to us. And this always happens at the worst time, even when you're talking to a person right in front of you. It was so annoying, but thankfully in 2002, Rockstar fixed this problem. We also have to mention the role that voice acting plays in this regard, which, as a first for the series, has Hollywood actors play each character. Now, of course, if we have incredible actors, this is going to translate into incredible characters. I'm picking up fallen activity. Heavier than normal. Something has got them worked up. I'll stay on it. But I don't like this as much as I should. The problem is that when Hollywood actors are used in games, it breaks immersion. Because when a character is talking, all I'm thinking is, that's Ray Liotta, or that's Burt Reynolds. It's not such a big deal as Rockstar haven't gone as far as modern games. I really don't like it when modern games use famous actors and literally mocap their faces into the game. This is actually immersion breaking, as we're watching an actor play a character, rather than being convinced this is a real person. It seems as if Rockstar agrees with me here, as they chose to avoid using famous actors in their later games. It's much better, and I hope other AAA games follow this trend. If there's one big criticism I have with the story, it's that it's one-dimensional. Once we found out who ambushed us, Tommy decides to work against Sonny and develop his own empire. After this point, we realise everything is heading towards a big finale, where we take down Sonny. There is a twist as Lance double-crosses us, which was a nice touch, especially when we're forced to kill Lance on the roof of Tommy's estate, but generally, it's pretty basic compared to modern games. And I'm not saying Rockstar did a bad job here, their focus was just on other parts of the game, and I'm confident if Vice City was made today, we'd have more in every aspect of the story. One area where things don't need improving are the missions. The best part about the missions is that they focus on fun. Gone are the frustrating time missions from GTA 3, and in place of them, we have bombastic action and over-the-top set pieces. You'll notice that a lot of the missions involve assassinating people, which doesn't sound that good on paper, but what's great about these missions is they are different every time. One mission might ask us to wipe out a group of wannabe bank robbers using a motorbike, a sniper, and a submachine gun, whereas another mission sends us undercover at the Leaf Links Golf Club, where we chase down our target in a golf buggy, which is so ridiculous, but so much fun. As with these missions, objectives are more action-orientated in Vice City. We have missions that are solely focused on combat, as we defend a point against waves of enemies. Sometimes we're on a yacht with an assault rifle, or sometimes we're positioned up high, overseeing a drug deal. We also have several turret sections throughout the game, which admittedly have been done to death in modern gaming. But in Vice City, the turret sections were actually some of my favourite moments. One of these, for example, is where we're shooting from the side of a helicopter set to the sounds of Till the Beat Goes On by The Whispers. And then this mission finishes with a fight through an abandoned mansion in an almost dungeon-like encounter, fighting past enemies and heading towards the final room. The fact we now have missions set inside is great for gameplay, as it opens so many options that we didn't have in GTA 3. GTA 3 did have a lot of variety, but due to limitations in technology, the entire game was set outside. The thing that impressed me the most, though, was the new motorbikes, as they open up so many gameplay options. As motorbikes are smaller than cars, we can now fit through gaps we couldn't before. So this means we can now have set pieces where we chase people through tight alleys on a motorbike, firing our submachine gun over the top in hot pursuit. It feels like we're taking part in an action movie. It also means we can access areas we simply can't with cars. For example, certain missions ask us to drive up staircases to jump onto the roof of the next building across. The absolute highlight here was driving a motorbike into an office block lift and driving out the window to land on the next skyscraper across. It's one of the most unique missions I've ever played, and it really does shame modern sandbox games. Of course, not every mission lives up to this high quality. A few of the business missions were tame in comparison to the rest of the game. 
The problem is that some of these missions feel like they were added at the last minute. The Sunshine Also missions, for example, ask us to deliver cars to the garage, a mechanic I didn't enjoy from GTA 3, as all we do is drive around the city, hoping a certain car will spawn. A mission for the film studio was another low point, where we fly through checkpoints for a bit too long, and the Cherry Popper ice cream missions, while adding more variety, were bland as we simply drive around selling drugs. I wish these missions were stronger, as the asset missions are arguably the best in the game. I thought the Malibu nightclub missions were outstanding, as we recruit people for a bank job, which felt like the blueprints for the heist in GTA 5. We go around assembling a team, and then finish by actually robbing a bank in a seriously impressive sequence. This is great now, never mind in 2002. Another area I was really impressed with was the amount of worthwhile side content. Sure, we have a lot of races, which are generic for a sandbox game in 2021, but we have so much more on top of this. We have a shooting range, rampages everywhere, a dirt track, remote control toy missions, pizza boy missions, and even a full-on destruction derby. These activities are already worth playing, as they're enjoyable in their own right. But Rockstar goes above and beyond here by making sure we're rewarded for completing each one. I know we had this in GTA 3 with the emergency vehicle missions, but now even the smallest of side content is rewarding. Like the shooting range, if we score 45 points in one round, we unlock a faster reload for every weapon. Or how about the Pizza Boy missions, which boost our health if we complete 12 in a row? Considering how challenging some of the missions are, these upgrades are absolutely essential. Although, there's one piece of side content where we're not always rewarded for our efforts, and when I played this mission, it felt like history was repeating. I've said before that the paramedic missions in GTA 3 are impossible due to rival gangs shooting your ambulance and blowing it up. In Vice City, this isn't a problem, as there are less rival gangs. But just as Rockstar fixed this problem, they created another. And if you've played Vice City recently, you'll know what I'm talking about. The Vigilante missions are essential, as they boost our total body armour if we beat 12 in a row. But I don't understand what happened here, as they were fine before. They were relatively easy, but they were ultimately engaging as we take down criminals in whichever way we want. For some reason though, Rockstar decided to mix them up and cause our wanted level to increase much quicker than before. This isn't an issue for the early levels, as two stars are perfectly manageable. Actually, it's more than manageable, as the two star cops are idiots who can be outsmarted by slowly jogging backwards. Look at this. What the hell is happening here? So, two star cops are fine, but the difficulty rapidly increases as soon as we hit four. Because my god, four star cops are so aggressive. They charge into you at full speed, sending your car hurtling through the air, just like before. Sure, the physics are definitely better than GTA 3, but we still have a long way to go. The way we're busted is also a problem, as cops will instantly arrest us if they're nearby with a clear line of sight. And if the doors of our car have blown off, which is common during the vigilante missions, the cops bypass the animation where they open the door and they instantly bust us. It's so frustrating, and I really wish there was an option to resist arrest, like in later GTA games, or even a two second window to give us time to react. There's just so much going on that makes it hard. The damage we take over time, the fact we can't aim on our target as we're constantly getting rammed, and the fact we need to keep moving to avoid getting busted. If we were in any other vehicle, it would be fine, as we can dash to a pain spray to lose our wanted level. But this isn't an option in cop cars. I even tried wearing a cop uniform, which usually means cops won't bother you. But no, somehow they knew that this person in a cop car, wearing a cop uniform and taking down criminals, was breaking the law. The best solution I've seen is to use the Rhino tank, which unlocks after 90 hidden packages at Fort Baxter. But nobody playing Vice City for the first time will have 90 hidden packages until the end of the game, by which point the armour bonus isn't helpful. The fact is that in places, Vice City is still punishingly difficult, where 50 extra body armour could be the difference between success and failure. Unfortunately, we still have issues with enemies hiding behind corners, so the first time we walk into an arena, we're shot in the back and we fail the mission. Once we're aware this is happening, it tells our gaming brains to play cautiously, constantly checking around each corner in case there's an enemy there. Sometimes this works, as we do find an enemy waiting for us, but other times we don't stand a chance. I can't believe this, but not only do we have enemies hiding behind corners, we now have enemies hiding beneath stairs. What are we supposed to do here? The amount of enemies we fight has also increased. 
the battlefield is now flooded with enemies to the point where we're outnumbered 6 to 1. So here we have to play cautiously too, peeking out from cover and picking off enemies one by one. I personally don't like this style of play, as it feels like we're playing connect the dots rather than a tense action game. Other times we have NPCs with us, like Lance, or the crew for the bank robbery. But again, this is a nightmare. They are not only extremely fragile, but they also have poor pathing. There were so many times I was waiting for an NPC to get in a vehicle, or wondering where they were as they got stuck on a wall. And if you tap an NPC with a car, or graze them with one stray bullet, they instantly die. This was at its worst during the bank robbery mission, which turned it from a highlight of the game to a test of patience. Like when the NPCs wouldn't get into the car when the SWAT team was stood shooting at us. So every time I tried to make a quick getaway, I was busted before my team got in the car. Over and over, I failed the mission, raging as the NPCs walked at a snail pace towards the car. And to add insult to injury, on my next attempts, before we'd even entered the bank, an NPC died crossing the road. Never before in all my years of gaming have I had to babysit NPCs this much. As soon as I took my eye off them, I was praying they didn't do something stupid and jeopardise the mission. I should say though, that overall, Vice City is easier than GTA 3, and there are a lot of changes from Rockstar to make this possible. Generally, there are more health and body armour pickups in missions. This means if the game is unfair to us, or we make a mistake, we can grab a pickup and we won't fail the mission. It's also easier to start a mission with full health, as there are more ways to heal. I really appreciated the new pizza places, where we walk into this pink marker, eat a random pizza, and heal to full. And then on top of this, we can heal at our properties every time we save our game. The properties are labelled on our in-game map, so we can easily head over there, save our game, and heal. Yeah, thank you Rockstar for giving us a map this time. The biggest improvement though, is the fact that a taxi spawns when we fail a mission. So, rather than drive from the hospital back to the start of the mission, we can hop in the taxi and instantly get back to the mission start. There's the odd time where the taxis aren't helpful, especially when we need body armour to beat a tough mission. We are given weapons at the start of a mission to help, but unfortunately we don't get body armour. So sometimes we do need to drive from the hospital to pick up body armour and then back to the mission. Overall though, it's a significant improvement and much less frustrating this time. Now, we know that Vice City was developed in a year, which is incredible, right? The fact Rockstar created something this competent with this many new features is an outstanding achievement. But replaying Vice City in 2021, I saw parts of the game that were rough around the edges, parts that could have been improved with more development time. Look at the rain as an example. It looks like Rockstar searched raindrop.png and pasted it straight into the game, but then forgot to trim the edges off the image. Oh, and the blood splatter effect is just a raindrop but coloured red. There are bigger issues though, specifically due to the way moving assets spawn. There was this moment I had inside the Malibu club, where I planned to have an epic standoff with the cops. I had a high wanted level and took higher ground in the club's VIP area. Well first of all, the cops just stood there shooting at me and didn't understand they had to go up one level to arrest me. The oddest thing though was the way they spawned. Basically, every time I looked away, a new set of cops spawned when my back was turned. You can see that right? I suppose if this happens inside one building, it's fine, but this happens everywhere in Vice City, including the open world. You can see here that cars are despawning and respawning every time I look away. This was frustrating during vehicle missions, where my car would despawn or I'd park outside the start of a mission only to find it had despawned after the cutscene. Other times, vehicles don't load at all, so I'd spend 5 minutes running around until I'd reached the next area and the engine kicked back in. It reminded me of Cyberpunk, where its roads were also empty, with a feeling of lifelessness that plagued the game. Okay, so I am playing the PC port here, which was released after the PS2 version, and you can fix all of this with mods. You could also play the PS2 version and not encounter these issues, but then you'd have the classic controls, with one analogue stick to move and the old way of aiming. But no matter what version you play, you have to admit there are other areas of the game that have a similar feeling of lifelessness, where something in the open world feels off. Now I will get to that, but first I want to talk about what the open world gets right. The open world in GTA 3 was believable as a real place. Liberty City feels like a place many of us live, a working city with its dense skyscrapers that pen us in, as well as that city soundscape constantly around us. Compared to GTA 3, Vice City is built differently. 
it's built less like a real place and more like a playground. On the mainland, we see this shown in its many recreational outlets. Endless hotels along the beachfront, nightclubs, strip clubs, shopping malls, and Leaflinks Golf Club in between both islands. When we go to the Western Island, we see elements of GTA 3's design here, in the more realistic downtown, the residential areas of Little Haiti and Little Havana, as well as Escobar Airport. But even in these realistic areas, we still see this playground style design, with staircases we can drive bikes over, as well as an obscene amount of ramps at Escobar Airport. And in the spaces between, there are more high-powered weapons this time around, like a rocket launcher in the pool of the Hooker Inn near the airport. So you can see, due to this design, we are never far away from having fun. Depending on your taste, you might prefer the realistic city from GTA 3, with its complex network of public transport on roads, or you might prefer the playground in Vice City, with a bigger sandbox and a focus on fun. Either way though, I think Vice City excels far more than Liberty City ever did. I actually said in my GTA 3 review that the map was superficial as we couldn't go inside locations like Liberty City Airport. Well, in Vice City, we can actually do that. We can enter the airport terminal seamlessly from the open world, head to the check-in desks, each with our own unique airline, and even go to different gates. One really cool feature is that we have to pass through airport security to get into the terminal. This means all of our weapons are taken off us and placed outside. The fact we can go inside this location was enough, but Rockstar took it to the next level by adding in this tiny yet effective detail. We see this everywhere too, with so many locations having little touches to make them special, like going inside the police station only to get a wanted level if we go into an off-limits area, or going inside the massive North Point Mall. I was blown away the first time I went here because of its size and also because of the different shops, and the little detail here was a car in the mall to hijack and drive around. I mean, video games give us an opportunity to do things we can't in real life, and Vice City completely understands this. Nowadays, most open worlds have inside spaces, but back in 2002, there was nothing close to this. To be fair, there were definitely games that seamlessly transitioned exterior and interior gameplay. Mafia for one did this, and The Getaway had interior spaces that were impressive, but nothing was on the same level as Vice City. Nothing was this large, with this much detail, and we see this highlighted in IGN's review at the time. One thing that set Vice City apart from its peers was the way that all of this is presented in a realistic way. It makes sense that the police would be suspicious if we walked into their station, and even with the car in the mall, it's part of a competition for everyday shoppers. Sure, Vice City is more of a playground than Liberty City, but due to these realistic touches, it never goes too far. I actually played Just Cause 4 recently, and Just Cause does go too far, the island of Solis is more like a playground and less like a real place, but Vice City got this balance just right. The point is, other games don't have this layer of realism, they don't have this attention to detail to help sell their world. And you know, I had a similar experience playing Vice City than I did playing Red Dead Redemption 2, completely in awe at the tiny details scattered throughout the game. I noticed this instantly when I first got on a motorbike. I jumped on, started driving, and had to pick my jaw up off the floor as Tommy's shirt blew in the wind. The more I played Vice City, the more these details surprised me, and I wish I could spend five minutes listing them all as they are so good. But here's a few of the highlights. Jellyfish in the sea at the beach, the way trees blow when we fly a helicopter nearby, baggage handlers driving around the airport, people in golf outfits at the golf club, NPCs with cameras around their necks showing their tourists, the way we have Vice City weather reports on the radio, the billboards at the airport welcoming tourists to the city, and the fact cops arrest NPCs in the open world. We can even get involved here and help the cop for a good citizen bonus. That is absolutely genius by the way. But going back to that feeling of lifelessness, the open world can fall apart. Even though the interiors were incredible, they needed more. Like in North Point Mall, where no NPCs were in the shops. Considering the technology at the time, it is a bit much to expect people to be sat at tables, but compared to Rockstar's later games, this is an area where Vice City could also be improved. In terms of map design, more could also be improved to pad out the world. I noticed this happened a lot during my playthrough, where I'd see something cool in the distance and head over there to look around, but then when I'd get there, there was nothing to find. In the junkyard, for example, which is quite a large area, there was only a weapon pickup and nothing else. There's also a huge freighter down at the docks, and we can explore its upper decks freely. But again, there was nothing up there. I was always confused when this happened, because in GTA 3, these moments would usually reward us with a hidden package. But later on, I realised why these areas were here. 
It turned out these locations were built specifically for missions and that's it, they're never used again. So if you go here before the mission, all you find is a dead end. This was frustrating when exploring, but it also has negative implications for gameplay. There are a lot of alleyways or gaps between buildings in Vice City, which mostly we can drive a vehicle through. But there was the odd time where these gaps didn't lead anywhere. Every time this happened, it slowed down gameplay as I had no option but to slam on the brakes and turn around. And if this happens during a high level police chase, we're basically screwed, trapped in an enclosed space as aggressive cops pile in. Maybe this is the point, maybe it's designed to force us into uncomfortable positions, but I do feel with more time, these areas could have been looked at and improved to benefit gameplay. Okay, so I think it's about time to answer that final question. Is GTA Vice City still great? Now, to answer this question, I want to quickly look at why Vice City is a fan favourite in the series. I've mentioned that Vice City isn't perfect and how a longer development time would have benefited the game. And when I found these issues during my playthrough, I struggled to see why it was a fan favourite and I felt that near perfect image I had from my childhood start to slip away. But the more I played, the more I became engrossed in its atmosphere. It's not just the fact the missions are incredible and the game is fun with the playground feel throughout, it's the atmosphere that makes Vice City special. It's the 80s theme, the neon lit buildings, the clothes, the cars and the radio. The radio stations in Vice City are one of the best parts of the game, each with an 80s inspired soundtrack that are so infectious I'm listening to them as I write this review. For every time I was frustrated at the difficulty or disappointed in areas of the map, none of that mattered as soon as I got in a car and put the radio on. Driving down Ocean Beach and listening to power ballads on the radio was like everything in Vice City came together in the best possible way. It's an example of a game excelling in one area and how that area is so strong it makes up for the rest of its issues. And it's for that reason that Vice City is still great. But yeah, if Rockstar can pull this off in one year alone, just imagine what they could achieve in two.